Okay, for those of you that are familiar with the term diaspora, I'm going to be speaking on the diasporatic person. Um, this is someone that is indigenous to the land and the continent of Africa and those that are coming over in a transitional form. Now this is going to counter a lot of the understandings that we have when we talk about traditional migratory and transitional people as well as refugee and asylum. But we're going to be speaking specifically to the international form as it relates to Africa and the diaspora uh, people of the land. Um, yes, this is my information. I don't know if you can see it because I didn't highlight the emails in white, so I apologize. But this is my information. I am Dr. Mina Ali. I work for UN Women, uh, Gambia specifically, and that is the tribal region of my people. Um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, right down the street. In, East Flatbush, Brooklyn, but um, my lineage leads us back to the Gambia. Now, how did that happen? Uh, quick story is, in 2012, I was told, I was asked where I was from, and I didn't know, and I couldn't answer that. And most people think, well, you're just from America, but she was asking more intuitively, where are you from? And I couldn't answer that. So in 2013, I took a bacon swab. Anybody familiar with the DNA practices that are happening now, the genetic tracing? And it was called AfricanAncestry.com. And you put, it's a little Q-tip. Well, actually, it's a long Q-tip. And you put it in the corner of your cheek. You send it away, and it gives you your outpouring of tribal lands, people, and that sort. And I found out that I was from the Senegambia region. Well, if you know anything about Africa, Senegal is this little sea that's up in the upper uh, western area and there's a little sliver of a land i mean literally if you blink you'll miss it and it's called the gambia and that is an actual indigenous country that has been sovereign and separated from senegal as well as the european factions since the 60s and the gambia is actually where my tribe is from i'm from the fula tribe or the fulani tribe of the gambia um, and my people are called the griot g-r-i-o-t people and to know that the ancestry led me all the way back to a specific people gave me the opportunity to finally answer her question. So anytime someone asks me where I'm from, I used to say I'm from Brooklyn, now I say I'm from the Gambia. And because I speak English so well, they're like, no, nah, for real, where are you from? And I'll tell them, okay, I was born in Brooklyn. But the ancestry is there, and thus began my um, interest and my understanding as to how I got here. You know, sometimes you ask yourself, based on you being a first generation, you understand how you got here. Your parents came over here, you were born here, and the rest is history. But when you don't know how you got here, you begin to question. And for people of the African continent, we've had to ask that question. Many of us have European last names. Many of us were given European last names, and we want to know how we have a German last name, like over, um, excuse me, uh, Bell, that's my maiden name, and yet I'm African American. How did that happen? We didn't know, and because we didn't know, we had to investigate. So thus in lies the understanding of finding a trace lineage and a people, and that's where I began. So that's a little pathology, a little um, background. But the voice of the diaspora has now in, in need of being heard. So many times we hear the uh, Black Lives Matter, and you hear all of this, our lives matter, and all of the lives, yes, all of our lives matter, but the understanding of the African American voice has been muted for years. It's been muted intentionally, and it's been muted on purpose, and there's a difference. Intentionally is, is more pathological. It's, it's done to do that so that you stay down, and that, that moral attrition sets in where you feel like you don't have a voice. And then when it's muted on purpose, it's saying that you're not as important. So now, with the new climate and new resurrection of our voice, we are designing and divining a plan to speak. Well, sometimes when you give somebody a mic, they'll just get up there and they'll just, oh, well, I just want to say something. Okay, so what are you saying? Social media does that now. It gives everyone a voice, but it doesn't allow them to know what they have to say, something productive, something that is going to empower and educate people. Well, we've decided as a people, and as you know, the revolution will not be televised, so as a people, we have decided that we're going to learn how to speak, and we're going to speak with articulation, and we're going to speak with intention, so that we can have our voice heard in the same arenas that are being spoken um, around the world, and thus has brought me today here to speak on the voice of the diaspora. Okay, the historical perspective is in four points. Our land, which is the African continent, which is oil, nutrient, and material rich, yet the poorest in commodity training, trading. What does that mean? That means we have so much, but we give it all away that we don't have enough for ourselves. Your grandmother used to say you can't pour from an empty cup, which means you can't 
give something that you don't have. Well, with so many people that are giving to us as far as trade and trade options, they're taking more than they agreed to. So we're now, um, uh, what did they call it? We're, we're land rich and cash poor. And that's because we're not, we weren't able to understand the full value and the interest of who we were as a people. Now that it's changing and we're starting to do more import export and we're gaining our momentum. It's not as fast as we like it, but we are gaining that. Next one is our people, the diaspora. We once ruled as kings and queens. There wasn't a tribe that you could find in Africa a hundred years ago. I'm just gonna say a hundred years ago that didn't have ancestry and lineage to a tribe of, of royalty. And this is placated on our determination of royalty, our voice, our side, our understanding of what royalty was. It, now it is seen as, as the European model. Um, of course, you see Queen Elizabeth, and you see all the, the matriarchal pomp and circumstance, and you just assume that if we don't have that, that we're not royal. And that's the misunderstanding. When we came from kingdoms and queendoms in Africa, mostly queendoms, a little side note, um, that we had a rule and we had a specific turn of understanding in the African country. Now, our purpose, we are self-made tribal interdependent. What does that mean? Anybody? Self-made tribal interdependence. Nobody? Yes. Uh, you choose to live in, well, it's, it's a choice to live in um, smaller communities, mm. where everybody has a role in the community. Very good. Awesome. That is exactly right. We have decided that everyone is going to have a role and a place. There isn't a... Uh, a structure as we see in this European concept of mother, father, sister, brother. We have tribe. Now you just so happen to have had children, so of course you are a mother. But it's almost like walking down the street and someone having to describe what I look like. You kind of know I'm a black woman. The evidence doesn't need to be described. So when we say we are matriarchal, we are matriarchal in how we reign, not necessarily in how we are lineage. And most people don't understand that. We don't walk around saying I'm a mother or I'm a father, or I'm a little sister. That really isn't necessary. Sometimes we'll, see, we'll say that, especially when we're in European settings, but normally what we say is you'll hear head of tribe, you'll hear uh, parliamentarian or legal of tribe, you will hear we are um, the, the executors of tribe, executor not in slashing, no, not that type of executor, executor as in the work habits, things you execute in the tribe. Are you um, blacksmiths? Are you um, sailors uh, and traders? So, so it's almost like the CEO would be the, the executorial piece that they're talking about. And we say that because that's what's more important in our tribe. When we can get the job done, when we can exercise our roles, rights, and responsibilities, and when we can, we can sustain and attain the rights and roles of the tribe and continue it in its legacy, we feel we're successful. We don't need titles and roles. That's a European model and concept that we don't normally adhere to. But our interdependence is very evident. Our plight, we were removed from our land. I'll say that again. We were removed from our land. Why do I say that? Let's talk about this pink elephant in the room. We were removed. Forcefully. Right, but why were we removed? Because you were, you were considered a commodity. Very good, very good. We were removed because we were the commodity. Although we had a very rich land, which is why we still don't understand that. If you had gold and silver and jewels and everything that you wanted from our land, why would you take our people? Why would, why would there be a need to take our people? So now, understanding that we are a commodity to this day, and what we understand in that commodity is the ability to ascertain things that are not necessarily seen as wealthy or an investment, we were brought to another land to build that land. And what was the land that we were brought to? The American South, the Caribbean. The Caribbean, okay. Haiti. Haiti, oh wow, great one. North and South America. Very good, that was a huge one also. What other land were we brought to? Portugal. Very good. So we'll say the Eastern Bloc. Why were we brought to the Eastern Bloc? Nobody knows this. Yes. Plantation. Plantation. Well, that, that's where the Americas got it from. That's correct. Those were all countries, places that were being colonialized. Very good. 
very good. They need workers. But we always thought, well, if y'all are doing the reintegrating, why do you need us to come over and help you? I mean, if that's what you want to do, why are you bringing other people over to do what you want to do? Aren't there enough people in your tribe, in your clan? Aren't there enough people in your neck of the woods to do what you want to do in your land? Why do you need other people? So the questions always relate to the why. We never got an answer. Of course, we probably won't get an answer now because those that did it are no longer here. But the understanding was that for you to take a, a people from a land to do something that you are wanting in your land means that there, you weren't sufficient in your right. That goes to say, why weren't you sufficient? Why are you taking all these boats and vessels and going to other land to find people to bring back to your land or to this new land that the indigenous people are already here? Why, why would you need to do that? Anybody? Yes. Because you couldn't do it. You weren't crafted. That's exactly right. The talent wasn't there. And when they came to other lands, they saw that the talent was there. We had the domes. We had the things that were there, such as the pyramid that they still can't figure out. They had the buildings and the infrastructure. They had the clarity of mind to be able to build from the resources that they had, and they didn't have to impede on the land in and of itself. Yes, ma'am. Very good, very good. Now, that's a good question based on where you were in the continent, okay? Now, we're talking West Africa as we'll, we'll use that as an example. Now, Gambia is a inland, it's a little inland country and right smack in the middle of it is water. Um, and because of that, we did a lot of water things. And, I, and I'm going to say that in its inclusivity because we also traded on the water, we also used the water, and we also were preservers of the water. So that's why I said we did a lot of things. Now, there are people that were inland that needed the water. So we would create mindsets and plans and protocols to be able to cast them out. But did we use money as our currency? No. What did we use? A trade. A trade. We were barterers. We were barterers by right. The only use for commodity was Western influence and the, and the Eastern Bloc influence because they used that as their commodity. So what did they do? That, was, that leads into my next piece. They went into the coercion of land with promises of a better life in a new world. They used the commodity of coins, of money, of currency to say that it was worth more than what we were bartering and trading for. In our curiosity, and again, this is the chicken and the egg. If they didn't come over, we wouldn't have this conversation. But when they came here, why did we have this conversation? So we are, we're saying that and saying that when they came over and they offered these coins and these commodities as new and different and improved and more civilized was the word, they used that to kind of say, well, if there's something better, maybe we need to investigate it. So they said, well, come on over. Come on, we got a new land, we're going to build with this currency and this commodity, and maybe you can help and you can share in the riches. That was the ploy to get us over here. Now, once we were here, what were we allowed to do? Manual labor. Manual labor. Somebody else said something. I heard it in the back. Nothing else? Nothing else. We run it, man, just manual labor. That's all we, that's the story, huh? That's the, story. <laughs> that's the story. And we have to talk about the pink elephant in the room. That's why I'm using these and I'm speaking like this because we have to begin to have this conversation and be healthy with it because if we don't, we will continue this cycle of oppression. So we need to talk about it. Yes. There we go. Now, we were also made to change our language, change our name. When we came over here, we were our first name, which may have been Mary, but then we were Stewart because we were property of Martha and George Stewart. So we were named, made to change our last name. Your last name in the European concept is your identity. So you are property of because you, they want you to identify with that property and identify with that people. Yes, ma'am? In, in, well, in Africa, the people have surveyed. Or just a first name. <laughs> See? And, and, that's, and I'm glad you said that. I'm glad there's a, there was an evident ignorance that was said in this. And I say ignorance not in a bad way. Ignorance as she didn't know. She said that she didn't know if Africans actually had a last name. 
And that makes sense because we weren't given our last name. We weren't told that we had a last name and we weren't respected in keeping our last name. Just as important as your last name is to be carried on in marriage and tradition, our last names were taken, especially our first names. So if we had Miriam, it was shortened to Mary. Miriam being a, a, a truly uh, tribal name, it was shortened to Mary. So now you're Mary Stewart instead of Miriam, maybe Abu Jabi. That's a, that was a big name historically, um, and that was uh, strong people. Um, and in a wolf tradition, Abu Jabi was actually strong as in mighty people. So to know that Miriam Abu Jabi is now Mary Stewart, now you change the whole course of that person's life because now their children are going to be born John, Bob, and Mike Stewart. They're not going to be Abu Jabi. So that means that we couldn't even keep on the legacy and the lineage of our name even after our children were here. So it's almost like, okay, you can do what you want to us, but why are you going to hurt our children in the land lineage that we have? All right, current perspective. Our land, it's a new continent non-existent and cash poor, lowest population in the world to own property and have property inheritance. Why is that? Let's just talk about the inheritance. Why are we as African Americans or Africans removed from um, our land now have um, the lowest property inheritance? Um, because there was nothing to inherit from the Very good. Why is that? Well, How about we weren't given it? Yes, 40 Acres of the Mule was a myth. It was never a reality. It was saying that if you, the 40 Acres of the Mule theory, if you've ever heard of it, if you're African American, you're pretty familiar with it, but if you're, if you're not, 40 Acres of the Mule was actually our gift for freedom. We'll let you go, and we'll give you 40 Acres of the Mule so you can start yourself on your way. And we were, yay! And we started renaming ourselves Freeman. So a lot of African Americans had a last name as Freeman. Um, free men meaning the free man that we were. We took, our, took off of our surnames and we had free men. We didn't know what our, our former names were and we couldn't use them, so we just adopted free men. And out of the free men act was this 40 acres and a mule that was concrete and said. But did we ever receive it? No, why not? Part of reconstruction. They're very good. Part of reconstruction said we're reconstructing this land that we brought y'all here to build. Now we're reconstructing. Did you build it the first time to redo it, or did you just say that just for wording? It was for wording. You weren't reconstructing anything. It was what we now call the zoning, the red zoning, the red lining. That's what they were doing. They were saying that this land is going to be for us, and then you can have this land. But then funny how that land kind of washed into that red lining back then. So it ended up that we never got the 40 acres in the mule. We never got that land, so the inheritance is low. Our people, the current diaspora labeled minority in class and race, and made inferior in representation due to the inability to be called live citizens. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Exactly, why was that? That was intentional too, why was that? Yes. Very good. That's right. If you can't, if you don't have an identity and you're not considered a person, it's like it's like giving land rights to this chair. You don't even know the name of the chair. You, well, maybe the owner has it written on the back, but you don't know the name of the chair, so you can't give it rights. You can't give it partnership. You can't do business with it. You can't trade with it. So it's considered nothing. And because they felt our mindsets and our ideologies and our standards of care was not something that they could cooperate in contract or in land rights or even in business, we were not considered a commodity. Remember, we couldn't read and write. We weren't allowed to read and write. We weren't allowed to speak our language. We weren't even allowed to communicate in your language because we couldn't read and write, so we couldn't learn the language. We had to learn by spoken identity. We had to learn by whatever language that person had. That's why there were a lot of African Americans back then that spoke Dutch, that spoke Polish, that spoke Irish and even Yiddish. Why is that? Exactly. If that's the only language that we heard, what else could we assimilate to? And then when the children were learning, what else language were they learning? 
So we didn't even have a language. We had multitudes of languages. A lot of uh, people will say um, um, historically that we are great at learning another language because it's inbred in us that a lot of African Americans can learn multitudes of languages and it's, they're impressed by how many languages we are, but we were forced to do it ancestrally. So when we're moving forward in learning languages, it's only innate that we involved into a, a multifaceted or very linguistic people. Okay, next one. It says, first deferred action for childhood arrivals. DACA, uh-oh. And stateless group. So how are we the first under DACA? Think about what DACA is. Very good. We were never documented. Our records are not at Ellis Island. We didn't have huddled masses except in a boat. We didn't have people that was able to be brought over here and they stamp it and say, oh, what's your name? Uh, do you have any lice? And are you afflicted by polio? Those are the questions they asked you when you went over, came over on Ellis Island. We didn't get that choice. We were huddled in a boat and we were sent ashore on a ship and they said the first 20 come on off, the next 20 come on off, and the third 20 come on off. All right, we'll see you later. And we were labeled as cargo on a ship. So we had 60 pieces of cargo that was given to that land. And in exchange, those children that came from that, those 60 people, those 60 parts of, of labor, were now considered under DACA. We were undocumented. So now we were the first actual citizens to be here on the United States. But because our parents weren't documented, we weren't documented. We were just chatteled off as, we were chatteled off as property. Very good. We were property of the next uh, plantation. Yes, ma'am? Um, so coming on the ships, um, everybody was randomly selected, or because I was under the impression that they were um, placed like at strategic strategically so that um, they understood the tribal concept, so they didn't want um, same language speaking people working in the same household or same plantation so that they can actually fit together. Oh, wow. So what was Nat Turner and Sojourner Truth? and? <laughs> What happened with them? I mean, did they figure out something new? No. I'm saying that because it, it always boggles my mind as to the stories that we hear back as to what happened to our people. Almost like that single story that's perpetuating in society, yet it's not being told by our voice. So it's like, how many people are expert at being African American, but African American? But there's so many people that are expert in the diaspora and they don't even look like us. And that just, it actually makes us laugh now. But to understand the true story behind that was they want, depending on how desolate the land was, they want the strongest people. So the Mandinka tribe, which is actually where my husband's from, he's of the Mandinka tribe, which was actually very robust men. Those are the ones that, um, unfortunately, the title was told that they look like gorillas. They're really big men naturally, and they're very robust men, and they used to call them apes and gorillas and all of the terms. Yes, let's talk about the pink elephant, yes. Um, and they would call that because they were very robust by nature. It looks like they ate potatoes and steak all day long, and they just naturally just swole up. And they were the ones that actually did a lot of the surveying and the, the, uh, the uh, settling of the land that was more wooded. So lands that have like tall trees, that we call it the Paul, Paul Bunyan theory. Um, some people want to say that he was uh, European. We believe he was African American just by his his stature and his nature. But he was the one that was caused to chop down so many trees. So we didn't need little men and women to chop down trees. We needed robust men. So part of that theory was true. The stronger men were brought, but we also had to have someone to cook and clean. We also had to have the tedious jobs that little hands can do, like pick weeds. So we had a variation of people that were brought, but depending on if the land was already um, colonialized and set up and you just needed people to maintain it, those are the women. Those are the women that kind of went over. But if you needed somebody to clear land and build and, and have that robust body, you would get a bigger people. But again, it wasn't random, it was intentional. I have a question about the current diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't mean, I don't mean this facetiously, but how do, uh, you know, current day African people, you know, from Gambia or wherever, mm -hmm. perceive Af uh, American, you know, African American. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there, Good question. Is there a tension in yeah, between, or they feel that, you know, you're in the, this uh, dispari, you're going to eventually come back to the motherland? I mean, mm -hmm. what, what is the mindset? Oh, that? that's a whole other story about coming back to the motherland, because okay. they're opening the borders now, and uh, there's yeah. so many people that make a mass exit, as you won't even believe. But the point in, in what you're saying, and more to your point, is there is a bilateral tension. 
those that are from the motherland that come over here want to be American because they see the popularity, they see the insight, they see the coolness, and they see what social media is portraying. And then those of us that understand the importance of returning home are now almost envious, like, man, you come from a place we wish we can go. So it's not necessarily attention per se, but it is a trying to assimilate thing. We're trying to go back and, and, and they're trying to come over here. It was a big talk the other day that more hair is being exported to the African country now. False hair, fake hair, killing us. And, be, and if you understand a people, you understand pictures of African people, we always had natural hair. If you've ever seen pictures of ancestrally tribal people, we always took care of our hair. In, in whatever way we fashioned it or styled it, it was always ours and it was always indigenous to our tribe. Now you see those same tribal women with silk yaki weaves or yaki silky or whatever it's called, and it's all the way down their back. And we're trying to figure out why that is because they're trying to assimilate to what they see women here that look like them are wearing. And it's unfortunate because, you know, tribally we used to take care of ourselves. Now, even us here in the United States, we're trying to assimilate to the European mindset by straightening our hair, by putting on our hair, trying to impose that our hair is all the way down here and it's bone straight. You know, that lends a false impression. A lot of the men are starting to say that, you know, they want real women now. And you'll hear that term, real women, meaning they want to see the realness. They don't want to take off your hair and your boobs and your eyelashes and your nails and just to get to the real woman, you know. And, and they're saying that because they're wanting to return, whereas those in the diaspora are now wanting to assimilate to what they see on Twitter and Pinterest. So you personally have made an accommodation in terms of how you dress and so forth. One more time. You, you yourself have made an accommodation, you know, to your to your roots in terms of how you dress and. No, 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 no. There isn't an accommodation. It's like it's like saying, are you dressing Polish or Ukraine? There isn't a, an accommodation to your culture. You dress how you dress, and it may be a representation to a degree. There may also be a likeness or a simile. But there isn't a representation. There isn't an African way to dress. They're just no. African material. There may be a, a customary outfit or maybe a tribal outfit. Mm -hmm. But there isn't a, um, uh, an intentional assimilation, if that's what you're asking. I mean, that's how you kind of integrate with your roots. That's what I mean, in terms of how you dress. That's just preserving the history. When you integrate with your roots, you preserve that history. So yeah. if you're from the Benin people, or you're from the Wolof people, or you're from the Fulani people, mm -hmm. you, you attain those tribes, regardless of what you're wearing. You're still attaining those tribes, so you're still having marriages, you're still having children, you're still doing your ceremonies, you're still doing your birthrights and those type things. Regardless of what you look like or even how long your hair is, you're still doing those traditions. And those are the things that we're trying to get back to, slowly but surely. All right, really quick, I know I'm short for time. Um, what was it? Okay, our plight, recognized as whole people and rightful citizens. Why do we need to be recognized as whole people and rightful citizens? Why is that important? Racism. Very good. We were never written into the Constitution. We were never written. It says all men are created equal. We were not considered men. We were not considered women. We were not considered, we were property. So we were not written into the Constitution. But the European mindset wants to believe now because they want to mill it over and say, oh, well, you're included now. So then it, are you incriminating yourself to say that we weren't, incriminate, uh, we weren't included then? Or are you now saying we're just going to enjoin you into our circle of men and women? Why is it that we need permission? Why is there an ingrained permission in that? Why do we have to be asked to be come into it or said that we are part of it? Why isn't that we weren't established in the first place? So that pink elephant is what we're asking for as rightful citizens. And that's the reduction of the Kessel Six score. Anybody know Kessel Six? Everybody should know Kessel Six scores. Stress? No. Okay. Okay. So Google that. Ah. Kessler six scores from the moral attrition of embedded insecurities. What's moral attrition? Go ahead. Very good. Very good. Attrition is right. It's the morality of who you are. You keep being told generation after generation, you're not a person. You're not worthy. You're not valuable. So what do we start doing? We start changing who we are to assimilate to those that are valuable and are worthy. Why do you think so many African-American women are now coming out here with blonde hair? There's a psychosomatic thing that's happening that we are assimilating to a people that we feel are citizens, that are right. Now everybody wants to look like the Kardashians, so now everybody has dark hair. 
Why? Because society says that that's the end thing to do. So now we see women of color with stringy black hair, but it's parted in the middle and it's straight down here. Why? Because Kim Kardashian wore it. Then all of a sudden she wore two braids to the back, Bo Derek theory, if anybody's over 40. She wore braids and then all the you know European women were wearing braids. Now it's now we're going back to braids. Now she wore the braids. So now braids are in again. And it's the assimilation to what's new and what's normal in society. We don't see many um, Europeans wearing braids unless they're in the hood or assimilate with those from the hood. But you do see a lot of your uh, African American people wearing straight stringy blonde hair, curly blonde hair. All of these things that assimilate to what society views as right. So if you look somewhat like that, maybe you'll have somewhat of the rights and responsibility. Next. Refugees. These are really quick. Basic protections is medicine, education, and employment. The diasporic refugee is someone that has a chance to return after flight or tragedy, but who's paying for them to get home? Who's paying for them? If they flee here as a refugee, who's paying for them to get back? They have to pay, but if you get us here and as a refugee, we can't work, how are we getting back home? No. Uh huh. So now we have to assimilate here, right? We have to assimilate in a land that's not ours because we're trying to get back home and it's not our fault that we had a tragedy that made us leave. How many people would like someone to come into their house right now and tell them you have to leave right now? Because our law says you have to leave right now. You have to, uh uh, no packing. Get your pocketbook and get your ID and your baby and let's head out the door. And that's what most people are being made to do in the continent. They're being made to leave. Why? Because of war. War is factioned by who? Why are we warring? Why are tribes warring against each other? They weren't warring against each other 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Yes? But they were always there. So why are they warring now? Oh, so now all these years we've been living with that unplanned land and line, and now all of a sudden we're warring against each other because of a redrawing of a zone? That's what we're doing here in the United States <laughs> with the redlining. They're redrawing the land, and now we're arguing over territory. So there is a faction here, but what about there? No? Okay. You had a question? I like that. Where I like that. Was than another, and Very good. That makes sense. That's how they came in with the currency. They said our bartering wasn't worthy of anything. They came in with currency and said our, their currency is better based on whose standards? Yes, ma'am. That actually came when we got here. But why would, oh, let's talk about that pink elephant. Why were they light skin and dark skin? Right. Why was there light, light skin and dark skin? Interrelation. Interrelation. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. She said interrelation. Oh, man, I got to give you a piece of candy. Oh, no, she said, no, no, no. She said interrelations. Oh, how sweet. Force, force. Force relations. Yeah, that's more. We're, we're hitting that spectrum. Right. Force relations comes from the blending of the blood. The European blood, the African blood. We were dark, 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 dark people. Why? Because there's nothing but sun where we are. And then we come over here and then our children start looking like me and even lighter look like her. Well, how did that happen? How did this mother that is darker than me have a child that's lighter than me? Especially as a slave. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, like Very good. Very good. Slave owners and their sons, because they monkey see, monkey do. So it's the slave owners and their sons allowing them to have property rights to their women. And those women were having children. And those children, because the slave owner knew that those are his children, what did he do with them? Treat them nicely. But what was specific that they did to them? Nobody knows? OK. They brought them in the house. They weren't able to, they didn't have to sleep outside in the, in the, in the outhouses. Uh, we call them outhouses because that's about as big as they are. Um, they didn't have to live outside in with the, the, where the slaves live. Why is that? Very good. 
Very good. They also knew that even though they treated us as property, they knew blood going through anything is valuable. So they wanted to keep an eye on it. So they brought them in the house and they allowed them to do domesticated work because they were half black. So they were doing domesticated work, but they were doing domesticated work with their wives, with the slave owners' wives, and with their children. So they became our first nannies, they became our first wet nurses because they were made to, to nurse their children, and they also became our first indigenous people that were able to live in residence and learn the traditions and the culture. That's how we learned our etiquette, based on European values. So again, we weren't able to assimilate to our own European values in that. All right, maintaining reciprocal ties with countries of origin. Chance to return after flight. Uh, oh, we mentioned that. Legal help. Legal aid is implied, not promised if you're not a citizen. And statelessness. No safe return to their country's traditions or inheritance. So why are we talking about inheritance going back, but there's no inheritance here? Nobody? Yes? Does that have to do with last name again? Very good. Very good. You go back home, and I guarantee you, you're going to see the Obajabis, Obajabis over here, and you'll know that those are your people. Why? Because they recognize you. They didn't leave. They're, you know, we didn't clear out Africa. We just took people out of tribes of Africa. So the ones that remain, they know who you are, and they, and they can recognize it. And just like with the genetics that I did, when I go back to uh, Gambia, my people know who I am. They even say, you look like you're Fulani. They will tell me, people that I didn't know, of course I don't know anybody over there because I didn't know who they were. But when I go and I speak to them, they'll say, oh yeah, you're Fulani. And I'm like, how do you know that? And they're like, well, we know our people. And you'll hear that systematically over and over in the tribes of people because you know your own. All right, next, um, asylum seekers. Seeking international protection within their country who claims have not been decided. Now here's that, that patriarchal thing again. Um, somebody from Africa decides that they are they are asylum seeker and they want to come to the United States uh, with this ban. What do you think is going to happen with that? One more time. They're going to get they, no. They're not even going to leave. They're not even going to be allowed to leave. Why? Because they don't believe that the threat is real. And the threat is based on the cognitions of the European mindset. And that is that European mindset that's here in the United States that is saying no. Nah. And most of the time, it's based on religion. So if you say you're Muslim. Chances are, I don't care if they're beating you in front of them, <laughs> they're not going to allow you to go because there's a religious ban now, especially in certain countries. All right, um, has to be categorized as valid before af actual refugee status will be offered. So again, there's that determination based on their own mindset. Based on religion, with current ban, 80% of applications are denied. Over half of those are denied reapplication for months or years. So again, they got to go back to that female genital mutilation. They got to go back to that violent domestication. They got to go back to that patriarchal system that was incre increased based on the colonialism that was given that the men are the head of households when they came from queendoms and women that were head of households. Often to northern and southern regions of their own country. Why are set resettlement protections offered to northern and southern entities of the same country that's abusing you? You kind of mention it with the zoning piece. One more time. I had mentioned how uh, it's Yeah, but why are they relocated to northern and southern regions of their own country? Because that's where uh, the population happens. Right. So that's, a, that's, a, that's a good piece of it. What would you say? Is it based on religion? It is based on religion. What else? That's a good piece of it, though. Yes? Very good. Northern and southern regions or ports of any African country is a, um, any African country is a port to another country. So what they're saying is don't come over here, go to another country. So they're seeking asylums in places that are northern and southern of each of their borders. Because what they're doing is they're doing an in-state asylum. So they're seeking refugees to go to other countries rather than come over to the water. Why? Because somebody's going to have to pay for that. It's easier to walk across a land, uh, landlock or rather than be shipped over to the United States. And then if they come illegally, we got to deal with the border wars and all of that stuff. And I, didn't, I had enough of a wall for my lifetime. Um, next one, the trafficked. Now, these are human traffic, migrant worker, transportation, and nannies. And we're talking about the diaspora, so we're not getting into Latino countries yet. But there's a big piece with this that is not documented, and that's intentional also. There's a big piece that has to do with migrant workers, transportation, and nannies. Migrant workers. When you see Latinos, you also see 
You said it. You, you see African-Americans. In, in migrant areas. You see Africans going out to the field as well as Latinos, especially those from Mexico. You see that often, but they don't document it because that's not something that they want to have on that. Here's why. Transportation, when you get in the cab, what are some of the three, what are the top three faces that you see when you get in the cab? One. Who, who's? Middle Eastern, two. African, very good. Why is that? Those are the three regions that had the most asylum. Those are the three regions that had the most uproar and the three regions that come over the most. So they are doing minimum wage jobs just to have a job to suffice. Remember that inter interdependence that we talked about. So now I have to feed my family and I have to feed a family of 12 and even if it's only $10 an hour, I still gotta find a way to feed my family because we're not gonna ask for help. We're not gonna go outside and go to HRA and get food stamps. Now some of us are now. <laughs> but as a people, we didn't do that. We didn't go to soup kitchens and pantries, and we fed our children and fed our people based on what we were given and what we earned, because that's how we were brought up. Now, with the, the laissez-faire of uh, social welfare, we're now being able to succumb. Why? Because the status quo is if you need help, you go there. They don't teach interdependence here. They teach assistance here. All right, um, nannies. Why do you see a lot of African women with nannies, as nannies? This goes into the next piece, actually. They may be sending money home. They're sending money to the family in, in the That's right. country. Most people that can afford a nanny is well to do. So they're gonna pay them a little higher wage and they're able to send that money home. And it also is able to pay off a debt because a lot of them paid for those people to come over here and now they're paying back a lot of those visas and those those ways of having uh, money dispersed in their community. So they're going to allow them to pay off a debt. So they may make $10 now, but only actually claim eight. Because that other $2 is paying them back for that visa that they just bought for. So a lot of that has to deal with the human traffic aspect. All right, sexually trafficked, prostitution, child pedophilia, donor milk, eggs, and surrogacy. But you didn't see that one coming. Donor milk, eggs, and surrogacy. Why is that a big import from people of the diaspora? Yes. Yeah, it's been known, just like when you had the wet nursing when the, uh, back in the day when the uh, uh, bubonic plague and cholera really hit the country, a lot of the Europeans' structure was not able to sustain a lot of that disease. And a lot of them were dying off. A lot of them had osteoporosis before osteoporosis. And a lot of them had brittle bone disease as children. And what they're noticing and what they noticed in the children, and this is just on the plantations, is that African American women were having 13, 14, 15 kids and going back out to the field and doing their manual labor. And none of their children were dying. And all these diseases were around and they didn't have any diseases. And what was a common denominator? They all had breast milk. So what did they say? Aha! Well, if their children are not dying and they get their breast milk, why don't we put our children on their breasts? And now the children are starting to get better bones and stronger bones and more malleable bones. Now, are we saying that's the only thing? No, but you got to look at the science behind it. You got to look at how they looked at it before all of the CDC research and all of the NIH research. You got to see that it was real time research that they saw. And what they realized is that their children were living longer after being given that milk. Now, the egg surrogacy, why is that happening? Why are we giving, why are they donating eggs? Yes, ma'am. Very good, very good. And I didn't even think you were gonna hit on the delaying childbirth. That's exactly right. Eggs are normally fertile. We have, we are, have the higher incidences, and you can Google this too, higher incidence of later term pregnancies than most races. We are able to have babies later in life, and they're noticing that our eggs, the pres preservation of eggs, and they, they want to say it's because of the melanin, but I don't know, there's outside versus inside, but there's a collagen factor that's involved in that, and they're saying that the preservation of the eggs are longer. So they're able to preserve that. Now, what about the surrogacy? You know, surrogacy is his sperm, your egg combined, but it's placed into someone else. Why is that happening? Right, so that they may not be able, they may have an um, inferior uterus, that type of thing, fallopian tubes may not be there. But why do you think that they're asking African women to do this? For the same reason from previously, of making the pain the child better? 
Right. As I mentioned, we had 15, 16, 18 kids. We didn't have, we weren't able to go to hospitals. I mean, it was a story written that in, in the 50s, we weren't able to go to the hospitals because they were afraid that our color was going to rub off on the sheets. Can you imagine that? And that was why we didn't have hospitals, hospitalization. And then they upped the price so much, still to today, that most of us couldn't afford it. So we had to have babies someplace. But if you're over the age of 70, I guarantee you, most of them will not tell you about a C-section. They won't mention epidurals. They won't mention hospitalization when they're birthing. Why? Because they weren't allowed to birth. I, my grandmother was a midwife, and she birthed over 10,000 babies in 60 years. And why was that? Because we were having a lot of babies. But we weren't birthing in a hospital. We had twins and triplets and breech births and, and rotational births. We even had stillborns that were all born in the house. Why? Because we weren't allowed to go to the hospital. But we still had to have babies. We still were populating. So one of the things that we are noticing is that we are, we're getting a lot of people realizing that and now saying, well, if they're able to do that, then we can go ahead and, and have them hold our baby and, and garner our baby. All right, next one, um, organ trafficking and harvesting. Um, highlighted in India, as you see on the television, but the promises of visa citizenship for black market organs are huge in Africa. Why is it not popularized, though? Why don't we see it on television? Too sensitive? Well, we see it from India, so why not? Why not Africa? Exactly. This is property, this is property, this is property, and now this is property. Have they changed it? They just repackaged it. There's that reconstruction that you were talking about. <laughs> That's the mindset. You just change the packaging and say it's a different gift. But how much of that gift are we really getting or how much are we giving out? So if you notice, all of the things that we have naturally are now being gone, being um, excised out. Now, India has been known for, they, I mean, they prophesied that uh, years ago. But they know, they're known for it. But it's really rampant in African countries, especially in South African countries. Um, all right, and the last one, sports and entertainment, NBA, NFL, um, NBA. I don't know if that's National Baseball League or Major League Baseball. Is a major league? Okay, yeah, all right, thank you. <laughs> um, have coached diaspora to play for their U.S. teams. You've seen it. They go over to their country and they bring over this new star. So our kids here are not good enough? They gotta go to another country. Why are they doing that? Because they know if you give them $100,000, that's a million dollars to them. They don't have to pay them as much, but it's making money for that team. Again, that, that trade, and we call it the new slave trade, but it's still the trade of bodies to make their money, which is just what slavery was. It was a, a marketing piece for economics. All right, basic needs, last one, last few ones. Um, uh, the assimilation to land and lineage is not for, is not their own. Um, why, it said, why do we have it? Why do they have it? Shoot. What do they all have in common? And the assimilation to land and lineage is not their own, like slavery, religious appropriations, we spoke about that, the inability to practice their religion for fear of inaccessibility or perceived as defiance. Linguistic barriers, not able to communicate needs and wants of survival and health and mental access care. Now, this one is huge. Inability to receive care due to status. Do you know refugee and asylum seekers have different mental health statuses and ability, um, access abilities? Did you know that? Yes. Yes, they do, especially coming from our country. And the reason why is because they don't diagnose us over there. They don't diagnose as much in Africa. Now they are, but they didn't. So when you came over here, there was nothing for you to treat. We had to figure out by example. And if you had schizophrenia, it had to come by uh, um, action or case study. It wasn't like we came over with a script of, of prescription medicines and a, and a background because it wasn't given to us. So now when we're coming over, they're saying, well, if you didn't have it, then you must not need it. But maybe we do need it, but because they don't see us as necessary, we're not giving it. And this is just basic, basing on refugee and asylum status. All right, our plan is, and this is what I'm gonna talk about more on our next, I'm gonna give up, yeah. 
I'm going to give up uh, the time. I'm going to talk about it on the 25th. Um, if they have me back, I'm hoping. We're going to have a four-point uh, plan of justice, transformative, inclusive, restorative, and integrative, uh, reintegrative. And these are the preemptive women, elders, and returning citizens, which we have to include because so many of our men and women are coming back from incarceration, and we're trying to prevent a lot of it. So I thank you so very much for your time with me. I thank you. I hope there's something I gave and I left with you. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate what you've given us. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'm going to finish up. Um, oh, yeah, we're looking for interns. Hint, hint. So then is my email address if everybody want to take a picture of it. Um, we're looking for interns to do more of the research, more of the work, learn more about that pink elephant, and begin to have that discussion so that we can get to solutions, real-time solutions, so that we all can truly live together. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Um, on behalf of our college and uh, um, Forum on Migration and uh, Institute for International and Cross-Cultural uh, Psychology, I would like to thank you for your fascinating speech and contribution to our events. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank and you. This is the second. Thank you. You're very welcome.